Hey guys, um, I know we've done a couple lectures on judicial review and I think we've done a good job going over kind of, you know, what this means and constitutional interpretation. We've gone over the rules of the court constitutionally and through unwritten constitution and I think that we've taken you through some cases. Um, we've done early federal cases, your Schwarzenegger cases and John Marshall, and I think we've touched base with some of your other cases. Um, I'm not really sure though, so I really want to dedicate a lecture to um, Supreme Court cases that pop up on the exam. And I'm just really quickly going to go through your, your um, restrictive cases, your cases where basically the court ruled um, for the government and against civil liberty or um, for expansion of power or denial of rights. Um, but I really want to get to the Warren Court and see if we can't do some of those cases today. Really quick, language on the um, court cases, you should know Marbury versus Madison established judicial review. You should know McCulloch versus Maryland and Gibbons versus Ogden in the context of strength and Schwarzeneggerism. Your negative cases, I call them negative cases because they're strict interpretation cases. Cases that kind of deny the person that's claiming that they want more rights. You have the Red Scott decision, which slaves or property led to um, inflammation of abolitionism in the North and uh, one of the causes of the Civil War. Um, you have Korematsu versus United States, the Japanese American internment camp case, which the government basically said because of national security reasons we can negate habeas corpus and lock up Americans who happen to have Japanese blood running through their veins. We also have cases like Schenck versus United States. Remember, Shank was a World War I protester, and he's screaming, Don't go to war! Don't do the draft! He's arrested, and he's claiming freedom of speech. What the court says in this instance is that Supreme Court, I'm sorry, that speech is not absolute. That you do not have the right to yell fire in a movie theater. And because of World War I and Red Scare and socialism and fear, um, Shank's words are seen as a clear and present danger. Um, the Klan, for instance, works with these rules too. You can yell bad things about other races and good things about yourself, um, but you're not allowed to say, let's go kill someone or let's start a riot. That's a clear and present danger concept. Um, Plessy versus Ferguson we've done and the denial of the, uh, the, the 14th Amendment by saying separate is equal. Um, I'm going through my head really quick with negative cases. Um, Worcester versus Georgia, you don't really need to know. I think I'm going to move on. We're just doing big ideas here for the regions. Please don't let this substitute good old-fashioned notes and, um, you know, it's more specific content, but you don't want to know that right now, do you? Um, moving on, let's do Warren Court, all right? Warren Court's big because Warren Court is the court, and it's the only other court you really have to know the name of besides Marshall Court. They don't do Rehnquist Court on the test in terms of the name Rehnquist, but Warren Court um, is big. Because they're going to take that 14th Amendment, the 14th Amendment which says no state shall deny equal protection under the law, and they're going to start taking action on that by challenging rules and laws that exist in states, which will result in expansion of civil liberties, but more federal kind of, you know, action. Conservatives complain because they say that's not Congress's, the court's job, that's Congress's job. But the court sees it in the sense of protecting liberty and the Bill of Rights using the 14th Amendment. Earl Warren was actually a Republican, dig that. Governor of California, I believe in the 1950s, um, or late 40s, early 50s, he was appointed by Dwight Eisenhower, who would later call Earl Warren the biggest mistake of his life. Because once Earl Warren got on the court, he, he wasn't conservative anymore. He was very liberal and loose interpretation. He took the words of the amendments and using the 14th, he, what did he do? Yeah. He made them mean more than they said in the first place. Um, think of like Bible interpretation. Um, you go to different churches, you hear different things. Some churches interpret the Bible where they allow gays to be welcomed and um, um, as part of their community. Others see it as a sin and abomination because they read the Bible strictly. Earl Warren's over here, loose interpretation. So let's go over some cases, all right? Here are the cases that I've seen on the test. Brown versus Board of Education we've done. Let's start in the 1960s. I've seen Engel versus Vitale. The First Amendment Free Exercise Clause says that Congress shall make no law of that establishing a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We're working here with the Establishment Clause that Congress shall make no law kind of picking a religion. So, um, school prayer was occurring at this point in many states, and um, Engel vs. Vitale is a challenge to that. Can the school lead a prayer in the morning or any time during the day? And the answer is no. The school is the government. 
And by the government reading a prayer, the government's choosing a prayer. And, and I know a lot of people get upset about this. 98% maybe in the classroom are all Christians who have no problem with the word God. Um, and God is a word that has kind of been used um, since the, the founding of the country. But it's not in the Constitution. The word God isn't in the Constitution. Um, and the rule is, you know, we, the, the government doesn't get to kind of sanctify that. People who say, well, it's on the money. In court arguments, they argue that's tradition. That's just part of our tradition. They don't argue that it should be on the money because it's true and everything else is not. So in Engel, the court's going to say, look, we need to protect the Hindu child or the atheist child or the agnostic child. And if you want to pray, that's a family-based activity. That's something that you do at home, that the government doesn't facilitate that. It shouldn't get in the way of you praying. Can you pray in school? Yeah, go ahead. Do it. Sit down tomorrow. First period, close your eyes and do this. Amen. No one's going to stop you. It's when the government comes into the picture. Other court cases that are on the test. Map versus Ohio. She, um, a dirty little old lady case. Yeah, I said that. Dirty little old lady case. She's a nasty little old lady. Map versus Ohio is the exclusionary rule. This has to do with evidence that's obtained illegally with a bad or not without a search warrant in relationship to the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment privacy into Popo um, says that you have to have a search warrant. And that search warrant is based on probable cause, meaning you have some type of evidence in order to get that search warrant. I can't go to a judge and go, can I search Johnny's house? Why? Because he's a bad kid. I need reasons. I need a fingerprint or a snitch or a witness, something. So at, in Matt versus Ohio, the police didn't have this as they were looking for a suspect in a crime that was related to Miss Matt. Ms. Mapp was hanging out, they knocked on the door, she demanded a warrant. They didn't have one, so they showed her a phony warrant that she then confiscated. She shoved it down her bra or something. And when they didn't find the suspect, they started digging. And they eventually found, ew, illegal obscene pornography. She's a dirty little nasty old lady. And they arrest her on obscenity charges. So the question isn't, did she possess illegal material? She did possess it. She's not arguing. She says, I'm the dirty little old lady. She's arguing that the police had no right to come into her house and find it. So what the court does is they take the Fourth Amendment and they create the exclusionary rule. Not only do you need a warrant, which it does say, but if you don't have one, it's out. You can't use it in a court of law. It's an expansion of rights of civil liberties or protection from government abuse. Other cases on there are Miranda versus Arizona. Miranda, most people know, or what they read you when they arrest you. It's called your Miranda rights. You have the, you can say it, I know you can. You have the right to remain silent. If you, uh, you have the right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, one we provided for you. Do you understand these rights? Blah, 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 blah. It doesn't say you need to do that in the Constitution. It doesn't say in the Fifth or Sixth Amendment that you're supposed to be told you have the right to remain silent. So when Miranda's arrested for a horrific crime that I'm not going to talk about, and he basically is forced to confess through interrogation, um, he's going to claim he had the right to an attorney. He had the right to remain silent, but he didn't know. Because he was, you know, maybe indigent or he didn't have an education. And the court agrees. And now the police must read you your rights. Fifth Amendment, whoop, bigger now. Um, Gideon versus Wainwright pops up on the test sometimes. We all take this for granted that we know that if we're poor and we're arrested that we're going to get a lawyer. Um, and most of you think that's in the Constitution. It's not. It says you have the right to an attorney. It doesn't say that you have the right for us to give you an attorney. This is like the right to pursue happiness. You don't expect the government to give you happiness, but the court now is going to say, look, that's the spirit of the, of the amendment. The Sixth Amendment guarantees the right to an attorney, and that is the spirit that if you can't afford one, of course we're not going to make you defend yourself, like Gideon in Florida, who was convicted. And remember, this doesn't mean you go free. It means you go back to step one, to a new trial, and now we'll give you an attorney and we'll try it again. I think he was found guilty again. But the concept is we've expanded those rights. Escobedo versus Illinois, um, that if uh, once you start questioning a suspect, once they say a lawyer, the, the questioning stops. Roe versus Wade, which is the Fourth Amendment, the right to privacy and abortion. You have the right to be secure in your persons. It's also a Ninth Amendment case that um, basically the Ninth Amendment says all rights not in the Constitution are reserved for the people. All of these are Fourteenth Amendment cases. 
every single one of them. So I have to end right now, I'm out of time, but make sure that you kind of go over those cases. Engel versus Vitale, Matt versus Ohio, Escobedo versus Illinois, Miranda versus Arizona, Gideon versus Wainwright. Um, there's some school cases I can't go over right now, New Jersey versus TLO, Tinker versus Des Moines, and uh, there's another one about school, Hazelwood versus Kirkwood. I can't do it, I just can't, good luck, bye.